Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Goff, I'd like to start out with you. Uh, the Center for Policy and Equity, of which you're the CEO and co-founder, as I understand it, has worked with over 250 police departments nationwide and has been dedicated to aiding police departments in understanding and addressing their biases. With that kind of experience nationwide with police departments, I'd like to ask you to just step back a second and tell us what you think the three or four highest priorities we could focus on here to do the best job we can in legislation at the federal level would be. What would you tell us to focus on at the federal level? So I appreciate the question. Um, there's sort of two tracks I would uh, encourage uh, this body to look at. One is, as you've heard basically in a uh, unanimous uh, chorus from the panel, um, is uh, significantly more accountability for law enforcement, um, more tools on the table for DOJ and a DOJ that's, that's willing to use those tools. Um, similarly, we want more tools, we meaning the scientific community and those who work closely with law enforcement, more tools for law enforcement executives to hold their own officers accountable. Um, I talk with uh, police chiefs and sheriffs and superintendents all over the country um, who want to get rid of the officers that they know are bad, that their training division knows are bad, um, that their shift lieutenants know are bad. But because of the contracts in place um, and the, the high standard one uh, must meet, they can't get rid of the officers they know are going to eventually become a problem. But there's a second track, which we've also been talking about. And I don't want us to be distracted by the language um, that, that is used to introduce this idea. Communities that don't have the money to take care of themselves, that don't have the public resources to take care of themselves, and, and the only thing that gets funding is police, they're gonna call the police a lot. That's going to make the community less safe, but it's also starting with communities that are less safe. So there is a second track that I hope will be part of a longer conversation of how to make sure that the most vulnerable and the most forgotten communities of all races, but particularly black communities, how they're able to get access to resources so they don't need to call the police in the first place. This is not a controversial position. It's a position that police chiefs like, it's a position that communities like, and frankly, I think is as consistent with the American values as any solution we can come out of from this moment. Is that similar to trying to assure that we can actually build the American dream in these communities and that that will help? Not just build it up, but build the promise of it for the, the young people who are coming up looking forward to it. I cannot tell you the number of communities where I go and speak with young people who don't imagine that the American dream that everyone in this room has had uh, an opportunity to be part of, that that's part of the future they can aspire towards. And I'm not saying that there is a deficit of hope or aspiration in vulnerable communities. I'm saying that they understand that there's a contract we were supposed to offer to them and that we as a country have broken it. Well, thank you. And Mayor, Mayor Carter, could you comment on this? Um, you're a mayor of a, of a city. Could you comment on the second track that Dr. Goff just talked about? Uh, yes, Senator, thank you very much. First, I fully agree that those are the two tracks. I think even within uh, that alternative track that we just described as ensuring that the mayor is real for people, I think that's very important. Also within that, on a more immediate level, we can ensure people call 911 for all kinds of Sometimes it's because someone's being robbed and there's something that may be one. And sometimes it's because I need help. Sometimes it's because uh, there's a person in crisis. Sometimes it's because I just didn't know who else to call. And so in the meantime, I think another track that, that alternative uh, track can take is saying, we're going to fund those social workers in community. We're going to fund those uh, drug therapists, those mental health counselors, all of those types of other supports in community. So that one, we can offload some of those calls from our police officers and law enforcement agencies who are telling us uh, that they are overworked. Uh, and two, that we can meet the level of need, the precise needs that our communities are presented to us with the level of resource that actually speaks to it, directly to us. Thank you. And then finally, I'd like to move, move to you, uh, Ms. Gupta. You also have been involved uh, with the leader, well, you're, you're involved with the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights. And you've developed um, a comprehensive framework of how to approach this issue. Uh, could you just take the remaining time I've got here and, and share with us maybe what you think the two or three most important pieces of advice you can give us here in Congress at the federal level are for where we should focus? So, Senator, I promise I'm not trying to be cute here, but the reason why the Leadership Conference put forth the eight proposals in our letter to members of Congress is because no one piece alone is... Uh, is going to be meaningful enough. So in the proposal are things like 
bans on chokeholds, creating a national use of force standard. These are kinds of these are the kinds of things that Congress is uniquely positioned over 18,000 police departments to articulate and change the culture of policing nationally in profound ways. But the other pieces that we had put in this were really about back-end accountability because when there is a sense of impunity, whether in this case we're talking about in policing, um, it really has impacts on culture uh, and interactions with residents. So we put in the need to expand Justice Department criminal jurisdiction for charging police officers who violate the law, uh, but also ending qualified immunity that has really functioned as a shield for real liability and consequence for officers. So I can't pick apart that we offered this as a comprehensive framework. I was really pleased that the Justice and Policing Act um, uh, uh, put incorporated this framework in um, but it really is, in many ways, it is the we need to be reaching at comprehensive steps here. Everything else in the past that we have tried has kind of nibbled at the edges, has tried to promote it through incentives or commissions and studies, and the reality is now that we need Congress to act in this comprehensive way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Booker. Thank you very much.